Chapter 10, Part 1 of How I Found Livingstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How I Found Livingstone Travels, Adventures, and Discoveries in Central Africa by Sir Henry M. Stanley. Chapter 10, Part 1 Jumrera Ukonongo. The 20th of September had arrived. This week ago I had decided to cut loose from those who tormented me with their doubts, their fears, and beliefs, and commence the march to Ujiji by a southern route. I was very weak from the fever that had attacked me the day before, and it was a most indiscreet act to commence a march under such circumstances. But I had wasted the shift from my seeds that a white man never breaks his word, and my reputation as a white man would have been ruined had I stayed behind if they sprang the march in consequence of evil. I must have the entire caravan outside the tender. Our flat and stool was well filled. The men had their loads resting on the walls. There was considerable shouting and laughing in the goyal fanfare. The Arabs had collected from curiosity's sake to see us off. All except the shape of their feet, and they had offended by their asking and resisting their wishes. The old sheikh took to his bed, but sent his son to bear me a last morsel of philosophic sentimentality, which I was to treasure up as the last words of the patriarchal sheikh, the son of Nasib, the son of Ali, the son of Sain. Poor sheikh, if thou hadst only known what was at the bottom of this stubbornness, this ass like determination to proceed the wrong way, what wouldst thou then have said, O Sheikh? But the Sheikh comforted himself with the thought that I might know what I was about better than he did, which is most likely. Only neither he nor any other Arab will ever know exactly the motive that induced me to march at all westward, when the road to the east was ever so much easier. My braves whom I had enlisted for a rapid march somewhere out of Unyanyembe were named as follows. John William Shaw, London, England. Salim Heshmi, Arab. Sidi Mbarak Mombe, Zanzibar. Mabuki Spoke, Ditto. Ulamongo, Ditto. Ambari, Ditto. Uledi, Ditto. Asmani, Ditto. Samir, Ditto. Kanna, Ditto. Zaidi, Ditto. Kamisi, Ditto. Chakaya, Bagamoya. Singaru, Ditto. Salali, Ditto. Ferris in Yanyambi, Rojav Bagamoya, Mabut in Yanyambi, in Yanyambi, Intaman, Dita, Chamba, Mororo, Sadala, Zanzibar, Kombo, Dita, Zaboi the Great, Mororo, Zaboi the Little, Dita, Mororo, Dita, Faraji, the Cook, Zanzibar, Mabut Salim, Zanzibar, Baraka, Dita, Ibrahim, Maroro, Zambuk, Ferris, Dita, Saluti, Bagamoya, Ingareza, Zanzibar, Amadi, the guide, Dita, Asmani, Dita, Dita, Mabuk, Dita, Dita, Amdala, the guide, Tabor, Juma, Zanzibar, Maganga, Nkwenkwe, Mukadum, Tabor, Dasturi, Dita, Sumayona, Ujiji, Imperanoto, Ujiji, Wakiri, Ditto, Nuku, Ditto, Mpepo, Ditto, Takindi, Ujiji, Mashishanga, Ditto, Muharuka, Ditto, Misosi, Ditto, Kufumbia, Ditto, Najwa, Boy, Uganda, Salali, Boy, Wenda, Salili, Boy, Wanda, Abdul Kader, Taylor, Malabar. These are the men and boys whom I had chosen to be my companions on the apparently useless mission of seeking for the lost traveller David Livingstone. The goods with which I had burdened them consisted of a thousand doti, or four thousand yards of cloth, six bags of beads, four loads of ammunition, one tent, one bed and clothes, one box of medicine, sextant and books, two loads of tea, coffee and sugar, one load of flour and candles, 
one load of tinned meats, sardines, and miscellaneous necessaries, and one load of cooking utensils. The men were all in their places except Bombay. Bombay had gone. He could not be found. I dispatched a man to hunt him up. He was found weeping in the arms of his Delilah. Why did you go away, Bombay, when you knew I intended to go and was waiting? Oh, Master, I was saying goodbye to my missus. Oh, indeed. Yes, Master, you know do it when you go away. Silence, sir. Oh, all right. What is the matter with you, Bombay? Oh, nothing. I was sure he was in a humour to think of quarrel with me before the Arabs who had congregated outside of my tender to witness my departure, and as I was not in a humour to be fought by anything that might turn up, the consequence was that I was obliged to thrash Bombay, an operation which soon cooled his hot cooler, but brought down on my head a loud chorus of remonstrances to my pretended Arab friends. Now, Master, don't, don't. Stop it, Master, the poor man knows better than you what he and me may expect on the road you are now taking. If anything was better calculated to put me in a rage than Bombay's insolence before a crowd, it was this gratuitous interference with what I considered my own special business. So I restrained myself, though I told them in a loud voice that I did not choose to be interfered with unless they wished to quarrel with me. No, no, Banner, they all exclaimed. We do not wish to quarrel with you. In the name of God, go up your way in peace. Very well, then, said I, shaking hands with them. Farewell, master, farewell. We wish you, we are sure, all success, and God be with you and guide you. March! A parting salute was fired. The flags were raised up by the guides. Each Pagazi rushed for his load, and in a short time, with songs and shouts, the head of the expedition had filed round the western end of my tembe, along the road to Uganda. Now, Mr. Shaw, I am waiting, sir. Thank you, don't you, if you cannot walk. Please, Mr. Stanley, I am afraid I cannot go. Why? I don't know, I am sure. I feel very weak. So am I weak. It was but late last night, as you know, that the fever left me. Don't back out before these Arabs. Maybe you're all a white man. Here, Selim, Mabruki, Bombay. Help Mr. Shaw on his donkey and walk by him. Oh, Baron, Baron, said the Arab. Don't take him. Do you not see he is sick? You keep away. Nothing will prevent me from taking him. He shall go. Go on, Bombay. The last of my party had gone. The tenders, so lately a busy sea, had already assumed a naked, desolate appearance. I turned towards the Arab, lifted my hat, and said again, Farewell, then faced about for his south, followed by my four young gun bearers, Selim, Kalulu, Matwara, and Balali. After half an hour's march, the scenery became more animated. Shaw began to be amused. Bombay had forgotten the quarrel, and assured me if I could pass near Ambo's country, I should catch the Tanganyika. Abuki Burton also believed we should. Selim was glad to leave Unalanda, where he had suffered so much from fever. And there was a something in the bold aspect of the hills which cropped upward, above fair valleys, that enlivened and encouraged me to proceed. In an hour and a half we arrived at our camp in the King and Mersey village of Unquenta, the birthplace of our famous tramp in the jungle. My tent was pitched, the goods were stored in one of the tenders, but one half the men had returned to Kuhara to take one more embrace of their wives and concubines. Towards night I was attacked once again with the intermittent fever. Before morning it had departed, leaving me terribly prostrated with weakness. I had heard the men conversing with each other over their campfires upon the probable prospects of the next day. It was a question with them whether I should continue the march. Mostly all were of the opinion that since the master was sick there would be no march. A superlative obstinacy, however, impelled me on, merely to spite their supine souls. But when I sallied out of my tent to call them to get ready, I found that at least twenty were missing. And Livingston's laboratory, Kay Palette, or How Do You Do, 
had not arrived with Dr. Livingstone's letter bag. Selecting twenty of the strongest and faithfulest men, I dispatched them back to Unyanyembe in search of the missing men, and Selim was sent to Sheikh Ben Nassim to borrow or buy a long slave trade. Towards night, my twenty detectives returned with nine of the missing men. The Wajiji had deserted in a body, and they could not be found. Selim also returned with a strong train, both of those in prison were within the collars attached to it at least ten men. Old Halef also appeared with the letter bag which he was to convey to Livingstone under my escort. The men were then addressed, and the slave train exhibited to them. I told them that I was the first white man who had taken a slave train away from one of his travels, but as they were all so frightened of accompanying me, I was obliged to make use of it, as it was the only means of keeping them together. The good need never fear being chained by me. Only the deserters, the thieves who received their hire and presents, guns and ammunition, and then ran away. I would not put anyone this time in chains. But whoever deserted after this day, I should halt and not continue the march till I found him. After which, he should march to meet each with the slave chain round his neck. Do you hear? Yes, was the answer. Do you understand? Yes. We broke up camp at 6 p.m. and took the road for Inasuka, at which place we arrived at 8 p.m. When we were about commencing the march the next morning, it was discovered that two more had deserted. Baraka and Bombay were at once dispatched to Unyanyembe to bring back the two missing men, Asmani and Kingaru, with orders not to return without them. This was the third time that the latter had deserted, as the reader may remember. While the pursuit was being effected, we halted at the village of Inesuka, more for the sake of shore than anyone else. In the evening, the incorrigible deserters were brought back, and as I had threatened to well flogged and chained, to secure them against further temptation. Bombay and Baraka had a picturesque story for the of the capture, and as I was in an exceedingly good humour, their services were rewarded with a fine sparkling. On the following morning, another carrier had absconded, taking with him his hire and fixing in the spots of the gun. But to hold anywhere near the end any longer was a danger that could be avoided only by travelling without stoppages towards the southern jungle land. It will be remembered that I had in my train the redoubtable after a fate of the terror. He who had started from Bagamoro with such slight anticipations of the wealth of ivory to be obtained in the great interior of Africa. On this morning, daunted by the reports of the dangers ahead, Abdul Kader craved to be discharged. He vowed he was sick and unable to proceed any further. As I was pretty well tired of him, I paid him off in cloth and permitted him to go. About halfway to Casagero, Mabuk Salim was suddenly taken sick. I treated him with a grain of calomel and a couple of ounces of brandy. As he was unable to walk, I furnished him with a donkey. Another man named Zaidi was ill with a rheumatic fever. I sure tumbled twice at the animal he was riding, and required an infinite amount of coaxing to mount it. Thoroughly, my expedition was pursued by adverse fortunes, and it seemed as if the fates had determined upon our return. It really appeared as if everything was going to wreck and ruin. If I were only fifteen days from Unyanyembe, thought I, I should be saved. Casagero was a scene of rejoicing the afternoon and evening of our arrival. Absentees had just returned from the coast, and the youths were brave in their gaudy bedizenment. Their new basatis, their suharis, and long cloths of bright new kaniki, with which they had adorned themselves behind some bush before they had suddenly appeared dressed in all this finery. The women high hide like maenads, and the lulu looing was loud, frequent, and fervent the whole of that afternoon. Those like damsels looked up to the youthful heroes with intensest admiration on their features. Old women cuddled and fondled them, statues and stooping back patriarchs blessed them. This is fame in their way. All the fortunate youths had to use their tongues until the wee hours of next morning had arrived, 
a lady you will wonder if they had seen near the great sea, and in the Anguja, the island of Zanzibar, of how they saw great white men's ships, and numbers of white men, of their perils and trials during their journey through the land of the fierce Bogoko, and of those other facts with which the region and I by this time well acquainted. On the 24th we struck camp, and marched through a forest of Nguji wood in the south-south west direction, and in about three hours came to Kijandi. On arriving before this village, which is governed by a daughter of Nikasira, we were informed we could not enter unless we paid toll. As we would not pay toll, we were compelled to camp in a ruined, rat-infested former, situated a mile to the left of Kijandu. Being well scolded by the cowardly natives for deserting the Siwa in his hour of extremity, we were accused of running away from the war. We were most on the threshold of our camp. Shaw, in endeavouring to dismount, lost his spirit and fell prone on his face. The foolish fellow actually laid on the ground in the hot sun a full hour, and when I coldly asked him if he did not feel rather uncomfortable, he sat up and wept like a child. Do you wish to go back, Mr. Shaw? If you please. I do not believe I can go any further, and if you would only be kind enough, I should like to return very much. Well, Mr. Shaw, I have come to the conclusion that it is best you should return. My patience is worn out. I have endeavoured faithfully to lift you above these petty miseries which you manage so devotedly. You are simply suffering from hypochondria. You imagine yourself sick, and nothing evidently will persuade you that you are not. Mark my words, to return to Unyanyambi is to die. Should you happen to fall sick and see horror, who knows how to administer medicine to you? Supposing you are delirious, how can any of the soldiers know what you want, or what is beneficial and necessary to you? Once again I repeat, if you return, you die. Oh dear me, I wish I had ever ventured to come. I thought life in Africa was so different from this. I would rather go back if you would permit me. The next day was a halt, and the rain heaps were made for the transportation of shore back to Kihara. A strong litter was made and forced back the garden of the hide of Kijandu to carry him. The bed was baked, the country was filled with cold tea, and the leg of a kid was roasted for his sustenance while on the road. The night before we parted, we spent together. Shaw played some tunes on an accordion which I had purchased for him at Zanzibar. But though it was only a miserable ten dollar affair, I thought the homely tunes evoked from the instrument that night were divine melodies. The last tune played before retiring was Home Sweet Home. The morning of the 27th, we were all up early. There was considerable viz in our movement. A long, long march lay before us that day, but then I was to leave behind all the sick and ailing. Only those who were healthy and could march fast and long were to accompany me. Babuk Salim I left in charge of a native doctor, who was to meditate him for a gift of cloth which I gave him in advance. The horn sounded to get ready. Shaw was lifted into his litter on the shoulders of his carriers. My men formed two ranks, the flags were lifted, and between these two living rows and under those bright streamers, which were to float over the waters of the Tanganyika before he should see them again, Shaw was borne away towards the north, while we filed off to the south with quicker and more elastic steps as if we felt an incubus had been taken from us. We ascended a ridge bristling with cyanide boulders of massive size, appearing above a forest of dwarf trees. The view which we saw was similar to that we had often seen elsewhere, an illimitable forest stretching in grand waves far beyond the ken of vision. Ridges, forest beds, rising gently one above another until they receded in the dim purple blue distance, with a warm haze floating above them, which though clear enough in our neighbourhood, became impenetrably blue in the far distance. Woods, 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 leafy branches, foliage globes or parachutes, green, brown or sear in colour, forests one above another, rising, falling and receding, a very leafy ocean. The horizon at all points presents the same view. 
The maybe an indistinct outline of a hill far away, or here and there a tall tree higher than the rest, conspicuous in its outlines against the translucent sky. And with this exception it is the same. The same clear sky dropping into the depths of the forest. The same outline. The same forest. The same horizon. Day after day, week after week. We hurry to the summit of a ridge, expecting for the change. With the wearied eyes, after wandering over the vast expanse, we turn to the immediate surroundings, satiated with the ever sameness of such scenes. Allow, somewhere in his writing, says that though the Vatican is great, it is but the chip of an eggshell compared to the star fretted dome where Arcturus and Orion glance forever. And I say that though the grove of Central Park, New York, is grand compared to the thin groves seen in other cities, that though the Windsor and the New Forests may be very fine and noble in England, yet they are but faggots of sticks compared to these eternal forests of Unyamwezi. We marched three hours, and then halted for refreshments. I perceived that the people were very tired, not yet inured to a series of long marches, or rather not in proper trim for earnest hard work after our long rest in Kuihara. When we resumed our march again, there were several manifestations of bad temper and weariness, but a few good natured remarks about their laziness put them on their mettle, and we reached Uganda at 2 p.m. after another four hours spur. Uganda is a very large village in the district of Uganda, which adjoins the southern frontier of Onyamwezi. The village probably numbers 400 families or 2,000 souls. It is well protected by a tall and strong palisade of three inch timber. Stages have been erected at intervals above the palisade, with military embraces in the timber for the muskets of the sharpshooters to take refuge within these such like stages to put out the chiefs of an attacking force. And in a ditch, in the sand or forest thrown up three or four feet higher against the paling, serves protection for the main body of the defender. We kneel in the ditch and the best enabled to defend a very large force. For a mile or two outside the village all obstructions are cleared, and the besieged were thus warned by sharp-eyed watchers to be prepared for the defence before the enemy approaches to the musket range. Nirambo withdrew his force of robbers from before the strongly defended village after two or three ineffectual attempts to storm it and the Waganda have been congratulating themselves ever since upon having driven away the bravest new order that the Mwazi has seen for generations. The Waganda have about 3,000 acres under cultivation around their principal village, and this area suffices to produce sufficient grain not only for their own consumption, but also for the many caravans which pass its way from Sita and Marundi. However brave the Waganda may be within the strong enclosure with which they have surrounded their principal village, they are not exempt from the feeling of insecurity which fills the soul of an Indian lazy during wartime. At this place the caravans are accustomed to recruit their numbers from the swarms of pagazis who volunteer to accompany them to the distant ivory regions south. But I could not induce a soul to follow me, so great was their fear of Mirambo and his Rugaraga. They were also full of rumours of wars ahead. It was asserted that Mbogo was advancing towards Uganda with a thousand Wakanongo, that the Wazavira had attacked a caravan four months previously, that Simba was scouring the country with a band of ferocious mercenaries, and yet more of the same nature and to the same intent. End of chapter 10, part 1